This could be the most encouraging video you will ever see. Christianity says Jesus will torment billions of people forever. That's a long time, and that's not done. Don't swallow their lies or their tiny Jesus. Biggestjesus.com Yeah, size matters. Why could this possibly be the most encouraging video you'll ever see? The last enemy is being abolished. Death. Have you ever thought to yourself concerning a dead loved one? I'll never see mom again. I'll never see my son again. I'll never see my brother again. If so, I pray this message will give you hope, faith, and expectation that you will see your departed loved ones again because Jesus, the Savior of the world, will successfully complete his mission. Make no mistake, death is an enemy. Death is the opposite of life. Death does not transfer someone to a new heavenly or hellish zip code where they are still alive. The dead are dead. I want us to look at the three aspects of death that Jesus will abolish. So what are the three aspects of death? First, we have the dying process. We enter into this immediately upon our conception because we are related to Adam. And I will get into that in just a moment. The second aspect of death is the death event. That is when a person breathes their last breath. Their heart stops beating. That is the moment when they die. And third, we have the death state. That is the condition of a person after their death event. They're in the death state. They're not alive. They're dead. So let's look at the current numbers based on each aspect. So if we look at those that are currently dying, we have seven to eight billion people. We're alive, but we're dying. Death is working in us. It's tearing us down. We're always trying to live. We're eat, trying to eat right, exercise, do the things in life that promote life to keep death at bay. Then we have the death events. There's approximately 150,000 people per day that breathe their last breath. And then we have the dead that are in the death state. And I saw some varying numbers on this, so I just, this is, may not be accurate, but it's hard to be accurate on this. But I think that we know it's a massive number. So I just kind of averaged out what I saw, and I'm going to say it's, 110 billion people are in the death state. So if we look at those that are dying, 7 to 8 billion, those that die each day, 150,000, versus those in the death state, 100 billion. The death state is the biggest aspect of death, numerically speaking. Now Christianity teaches that the process of dying and death events will eventually be no more. But... They teach that the death state, which we said is the, the largest numerical aspect of death, will remain forever. But, they tell you, don't be sad. Maybe you'll be one of the fortunate ones who will live forever, immortal and incorruptible. So to them, if Jesus leaves, uh, say, 100 billion people in the death state forever, well, two out of three ain't so bad. Don't be sad. So if we take a quick look at the truth of 1 Corinthians 15.26 versus the demonic lie of 1 Corinthians 15.26, we have this with the truth. The last enemy is being abolished, death. But the lie actually states the last enemy is not being abolished, death. That is obviously a massive difference that will make a massive difference for billions of and billions of people. So if we look a little deeper at aspect one, the dying process, we can see that Adam was created mortal. He was not created immortal. His flesh was his weakness. His flesh was created by God to be susceptible to sin and death if he transgressed the law, which is what flesh does. We read in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, and Yahweh Elohim instructed the human, Adam, saying, From every tree of the garden you may eat, yea, eat, 
But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat from it. For on the day you eat from it to die, you shall be dying. Now, Adam and Eve did not immediately die after eating, but they began to die on the very day that they broke God's commandment. And once God cut off their access to the tree of life, their dying eventually resulted in each of their death events. And if we look on Romans 5.12, tells us how we're related to Adam and this whole thing of death. Therefore, even as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and through sin, death. Thus, death passed through into all mankind on which all sinned. So death passes on to each and every individual human from Adam. So his sin opened the door for death to come into humanity. And now death is what passes on. And it's because that we are dying and that we are mortal, that is why we sin, because we're not powerful enough to resist all the things that get us to go against God. The adversary, um, the law was actually given so that sin would increase because when a law is given, that just brings out our desire to do the things against the law, like thou shalt not covet. Well, what do we do? We covet. So it's the death that passed on. Adam's sin did not pass on to us, but his death passed on to us. And we can see that death passes on regardless of sin with a baby in the womb that may die prematurely, that may die through a miscarriage. That baby did not sin, but it died. It's the death that passed from Adam onto every human that causes that. And we can also see in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. That word vivified means made immortal, just as Christ was made immortal, all will be made immortal. But back to Adam, it's because of him that we are all dying. And in 2 Corinthians 4.12, we read, So that death is operating in us. So that is aspect one, the dying process. If we go on to aspect two, the death event. Now, we can look at car crashes, heart attacks, shark attacks, being trampled to death at a concert, there are a million ways to die in the West, the East, the North, and the South. At the point of death, the Spirit returns to God because He is the one that gave it. Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells us, And the soil returns to the earth just as it was, that's our bodies returning to the earth, and the Spirit returns to the one Elohim, or God, who gave it. And in Luke 23, 46, we see a living example of this with Jesus on the cross. And shouting with a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I am committing my spirit. Now saying this, he expires. And we see in Philippians 2, 8, the death event on the cross for Jesus. And being found in fashion as a human, Jesus humbles himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. In my opinion, the death event is the most painful aspect of death. Even if a loved one is on their deathbed and we know that they're going to die soon, the moment that they breathe their last is still a shock to our system because that is the final moment of their life. So even when you think that you're prepared for the death of a loved one, you're never prepared for the death of a loved one. It's always a knife to the heart when you love that person and you see them breathe their last. If we move on to aspect three, the death state, as I said before, the dead are dead. They're not alive somewhere else. People don't die and then either go to heaven or go to hell. They're dead. Ecclesiastes 9.5 tells us, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing whatsoever. There is no further reward for them. Indeed, remembrance of them is forgotten. So in the dying process, we read that death is operating in us and we're dying. We're alive, but we're dying. In the death event, death is operating as it strikes us down, as we breathe our last. But how is 
death operating in the death state? What is death doing in the death state? The death state holds the dead and will give them up when it is rendered inoperative. Revelation 20.13 tells us, And the sea gives up the dead in it. This is at the great white throne. The sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. So we can see that the sea, death, and the unseen, which is Hades, they give up the dead that are in them. So to give them up would mean that death was actually holding them. That is, that is how the death state is operating. We read in Acts 2.24 concerning Jesus. Jesus, whom God raises, loosing the pangs of death for as much as it was not possible for Jesus to be held by it, the it being death. So death could not hold Jesus. That's why he was resurrected. God raised him from the dead. Death had no hold on him at the point of the resurrection. So the death state is active in its holding of the dead. That is how it is operating. And we see in Revelation 26, happy and holy is he who is having part in the former resurrection. Over these, the second death has no jurisdiction, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. They will be reigning with him the thousand years. So those that are not a part of this former resurrection at the beginning of the millennium, these will be subject to the jurisdiction of the second death, the first death and the second death. They hold people in the death state. It's not like people are struggling, they're just dead, but the death state is actively holding them and maintaining jurisdiction over them. We see in Hebrews 5, 7, Jesus, in the days of his flesh, offering both petitions and supplications with strong clamor and tears to him who is able to save him out of death, being hearkened to also for his piety. So Jesus was praying to his father. And we know that right before his crucifixion, his prayers and his anguish were tremendous. But he prayed to his father because he knew that his father was able to save him out of death. Jesus knew he had to go into death, but he knew his father could save him out of death and release him from the hold of death, rescue him from that hold. So we see at the great white throne, death, the first death, gives up the dead that were in it. Then, after the first death is rendered inoperative, after it gives up the dead in it, it is cast into the second death, the lake of fire. So the second death is the last enemy that will be rendered inoperative by Jesus at the consummation. So we read in Revelation 20, 13 through 15, And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. So we have death and the unseen, which is Hades, are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And the people that are not found written in the scroll of life, they're cast into the lake of fire. Previously, in the book of Revelation, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. So they are already there. But they are not killed in the lake of fire. They are tormented in the lake of fire for the eons of the eons. So the first death is rendered completely inoperative when it's cast into the second death, while the second death continues on. But we read something very interesting and encouraging in Revelation 21.4. God will be brushing away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, nor mourning, nor clamor, nor misery. They will be no more, for the former things passed away. Now this is after the new heaven and new earth come to be, and God comes to dwell with mankind on the new earth in the new Jerusalem. So we saw in verse 4 that it says death will be no more, but we see this four verses later in verse 8. It says, Yet the timid, the unbelievers, the abominable, the murderers, and the paramours, and enchanters, and idolaters, and all the false, their part, their part is in the lake burning with fire and sulfur, 
which is the second death. So death is no more while the second death is operative. How can this be? This is where the three aspects of death come into play. The death that will be no more is the dying event. The last dying event for humanity occurs after the great white throne when people are cast alive into the lake of fire, the second death. The dying process and the death state in the lake of fire will continue throughout the new heaven and new earth eon. So the death events will be no more. So we have one aspect of death down, two to go. The death process, the dying process, and the death state. So at the great white throne, those whose names are found written in the scroll of life will go on to the new earth, but as mortals, not immortals. There are only three events when God will vivify people or make them immortal and incorruptible. No one is made immortal at the great white throne. So we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 24, the events that God tells us will occur when people are made immortal. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Vivified means to be made immortal, just as Christ. So it says in verse 23, Yet each in his own class, the first fruit, Christ. So he's the example of vivification. What happened to him will happen to the next two classes, which encompasses all of humanity. So the first fruit, Christ, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence. So when Christ returns for those who are his, those who are believers, they will then be made immortal. But then we read in verse 24, thereafter the consummation. So that is the final vivification event. And that is not the great white throne. That is after the new heaven and new earth eon comes to a consummation. So those who go on to the new earth after the great white throne as mortals, they will rely on God's provision to keep them alive and thriving on the new earth. Though death will still operate in them, in, in some sense, it will be overcome and no one will die because death, the dying events, will be no more. We read in Revelation 22, 1 through 2, what are God's provisions to keep the mortals alive and strong on the new earth. Revelation 22, 1 through 2. And he shows me a river of water of life, resplendent as crystal, issuing out of the throne of God and the lambkin, the lambkin who is Jesus. In the center of its square and on either side of the river is the log of life, producing twelve fruits, rendering its fruit in accord with each month. And the leaves of the log are for the cure of the nations. So just as the tree of life sustained Adam and Eve in the garden, the river of water of life and the fruits and the leaves of the log of life will sustain the mortals on the new earth. The immortals on the new earth will not need food to sustain them, but they will be able to enjoy food just as Jesus was able to enjoy food after his resurrection to immortality. When will the death state and the dying process be rendered completely inoperative by Jesus? At the consummation. And we read of the consummation in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet each in his own class, the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he, meaning Jesus, may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he, Jesus, must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. And here's verse 26. The last enemy is being abolished, death. For he subjects all under his feet. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. This is the complete victory and success of Christ. 
death will not in any way, shape, form, or aspect have any place in the perfect, unending kingdom that Jesus gives to his God and Father. So the dead will remain dead in the death state in the lake of fire during the final eon, the new heaven and new earth eon. The second death, the lake of fire, is the last enemy. And we just read in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy is being abolished, death. So that's the second death that is being abolished. That's the death that Christianity says will not be abolished. So the second death, the last enemy, remains operative, holding the dead with jurisdiction over them until it is rendered inoperative by Jesus at the consummation. At that time, it will no longer hold the dead. So when the second death can no longer hold the dead, they will come forth alive and immortalized by God and Christ. And it will no longer at that time have jurisdiction over the dead. Now, this occurs again at the consummation when the last class of people are vivified, made immortal. This will include those that Jesus saves and rescues out of the second death and those that were mortals on the new earth. Both groups of people will be made immortal at the consummation. So at the consummation, all will, be, will have been vivified, only at different times. We have Christ, those that are his in his presence, and then those at the end of the eons, at the consummation of the eons. And again, contrary to this, Christianity teaches that the death state will remain forever, leaving billions upon billions of people dead and lost forever. Even though Christ was a correspondent ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2.6, meaning his death was completely sufficient to pay for all people for their sins and to, to give them the right to be resurrected through Christ's work, somehow... According to Christianity, billions of people will remain dead forever, and the last enemy, the second death, will not be abolished, and it will not be rendered inoperative. And as we saw before, we will look at it one more time, the difference between the truth, the life-giving truth of 1 Corinthians 15.26, and the demonic lie of Christianity's version of 1 Corinthians 15. 26.